there is something that God is trying to get to you. But your blessing, it needs transportation. There is a prayer that God wants to answer for you. But your answered prayer needs a vehicle. In other words, if you do not steward the relationships in your life well, you could be holding up your own cure. A network is a group of individuals who have a common purpose, a common interest, who come together to provide mutual assistance to one another. Your network is the purposeful relationships that you develop. Your network is the circle of influence in your life. And you should always invite the influence into your life. Let me say it a different way. Your influence should always exist by invitation only. Your influence should always exist by invitation only. Because when you think about it, when you are being influenced by something, it's because you've invited it into your life to be able to influence you, whether you did it intentionally or subconsciously. When you think about Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas sought out Paul. According to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 you'll find words similar to these. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution, everybody say disperse, that arose over Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Cyprus is where Barnabas was from, and Antioch. They went preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. So after Stephen was martyred, was killed, all of the Jews who were not born in Jerusalem, who were 100% Palestinian Jews, if they were not 100% Jews, they dispersed, where you get the, the word dispersion, they were dispersed and they ran and they fled to other cities. And so the Bible says they went to Phoenicia, they went to Cyprus, and these people went to Antioch. And so now they went there preaching the word, but they were only preaching the word to Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus, that's where Barnabas is from, and Cyrene, that is the country in Libya. They were not from Jerusalem. Now the Bible says who, when they had come to Antioch, when these people had come to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists. The Hellenists are Jews who were not born in Jerusalem. The Hellenists were the Jews who did not speak Aramaic as their first language. They were called Hellenists because they spoke Greek. And so all of the Jews who were born in Israel who spoke Aramaic, they had a problem with the Jews who were Jews, but they didn't speak the Jewish language. 
And so these Jews who were Hellenists, who didn't speak Aramaic, they all fled. They were being persecuted. They fled. That's why you had people from Cyrene, from Libya. You have Priscilla and Aquila who are from Italy. You have all these people from all these different places who had come to Jerusalem because they heard about a man named Jesus. They came there. They were converted and they became Jews, but they were they they spoke Greek. They did not speak the Jewish language. The Bible says that they were Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, follow me. And the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Verse 22, the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. So the church in Jerusalem filled with all the 100% Palestinian Jews, they got word that Jesus was being preached and that other people who had went to these other places who had dispersed and were being persecuted, they were believing, they were sharing the gospel and they were growing. So they, it got back to their ears that the gospel was still going forward. Is everybody following me? And the Bible says that... <clears throat> Verse 22, yep. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as the place at Antioch. They heard that of all places, the place in Antioch had a growing group of people. They had a church that started and this church was filled with a diverse group of people who were not born in Jerusalem. This church was built, this church was filled with people who had come from Africa, come from Europe, and come from all of these different places who were now Jews who believed in the word of Jesus Christ, and they were at Antioch and all these other places because they were dispersed. Keep reading, Isaac. When they had, and they called Barnabas, who became the superintendent of the movement. This is why Barnabas is so important, because the church in Jerusalem called on Barnabas to go and see about the word of God that has been dispersed and people who are talking about it and people who are growing. And in verse 23, when he came and he seen the grace of God, that they had started a diverse church there and they were, and they were growing, he was glad. And encourage them all with the purpose of heart. They should continue with the Lord. For the Bible says that, that Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Make sure that the people in your circle are people who have a good reputation. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Verse 25. Because the movement was becoming so large that one person could not handle it by himself and he recognized that you have limitations and when you recognize your limitations then it's easier to bring people in your life who can help you where you can't help yourself. But if you don't acknowledge your limitations, then you will never invite people into your life to help you in places you don't realize you need help. And so the Bible says that then Barnabas departed for Tarsus. Why would he depart for Tarsus? Because he knew somebody was at Tarsus who he who had a, a, a skill set, who had an anointing over his life. And if he can find this person, he can help to develop those gifts so that this person can become even better. The Bible says that Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Everybody say seek. Saul, who is Paul, he pursued. Everybody say pursue. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch because he needed some help. So it was so it was that for a whole year, they assembled Paul. And Barnabas, Barnabas sought out Paul, brought him and brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they assembled, they assembled, they began to build their own circle. The Bible says with the church there at Antioch. So he it took a whole year to to, to share the gospel and to refine their circle. And the Bible says, and they taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians. 
in Antioch. Everybody said amen. There was a skill set and a gifting that Paul had that Barnabas knew about. They studied under a philosopher by the name of Gamaliel. And so they had prior experience with one another. Barnabas understood this and Barnabas sought out Saul. The Bible says he sought out Saul because he knew there was something in Saul that he could help to develop and he can help to, to bring to light and he could also receive help on this particular missionary journey. Sometimes a mentor can find you. But there comes a time, there comes a season where the relationships you need will be the ones that you have to pursue. In the text, Barnabas becomes the mentor to Paul. He sought out Paul. And yes, sometimes your mentor can seek you out. But there comes a time and there comes a season where the relationships that you actually need the friendships that you actually need will be the ones that you actually have to pursue yourself. Everybody said pursue. Because there is an attitude that I said on last week, but there is an attitude that I'm not going to run after anybody. If I have to ask you more than once, then I don't need you in my circle. Impartation requires pursuit. To be deposited into, to receive deposits, impartation, it requires pursuit. And when you feel entitled, entitlement often kills pursuit. Because when you feel that you are entitled to something, you will never go after the very thing that you think you're entitled to. And so when you have and you feel entitled, that will kill the pursuit. It is the responsibility. I appreciate Apostle B for this word. It is the responsibility of the mentor to pour. It is the responsibility of the mentee to pursue. The mentor pours, the mentee pursues. Barnabas pursues, finds Paul. They're now at Antioch. Before a whole year, they were refining their circle. Barnabas and Paul are now seeking out some other individuals. And the Bible says that they were there at Antioch for a whole year. So we presume that for a year it took them to naturally refine their circle because the right friends are not microwaved. And it takes time if you approach friendship the same way you approach marriage, you take your time and you pray to the Lord, is this the right person for me? Will this person bring out the best in me and will I bring out the best in them? Is this the person you're calling me to be aligned with in this season? You don't just enter into the relationships by accident. Because we are not toddlers anymore. Barnabas and, 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 and Paul, they then take a whole year to refine their circle. That's when they find Simeon, the Niger, who is from Cyrene, who immigrated from Libya, Cyrene, and he comes and he's now in Antioch. That's where they find Lucius who was also from Cyrene, who immigrated and who was now there at Antioch. That's where they find Manaean, who is now there, who is from Jerusalem, because he's the only one who is 100% Palestinian Jew, who is also the foster brother of Herod Antipas. 
who is now in their circle. And so you have to understand this. Paul's circle consisted of people who all had more Christian experience than he did. Let me help you. Let me help you. The circle that Paul was in, he was not the smartest one. The circle that Paul was in, he did not have the most experience. Because Paul didn't have experience being a pastor and shepherding a congregation. Neither did Barnabas. They were two missionaries. And so Lucius also had the experience. And Simeon, those two had experience shepherding congregations. Lucius would go on to become a bishop. But these two had experience building congregations. They also helped to start the church at Antioch. So they had valuable experience to help this circle. Paul didn't know his way around the land. He did not know his way around the terrain because he wasn't a, he wasn't an evangelist or naturally a missionary, but Barnabas did. So Barnabas was able to teach Paul where to go, what cities to go, and why you might need to go here first. Their circle consisted of Manaean, and Manaean is believed, and we can presume that he helped with the finances because he comes from a wealthier background. We presume that he helped them to navigate through the Roman laws because he had relationship who was over someone who was over all of the Roman Empire at this time. Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, but he was also a great teacher, Manaean. This circle that Paul was in consisted of people light-skinned, dark-skinned, people who spoke different languages, people coming from different places. This was a educationally, culturally, socially diverse circle of men. This is why it's important when we get to Acts chapter 13 verses 1 and verses 2 and verses 3. Because for a year long they had been fostering this circle of friends. They got a chance to see one another for who one another really was. Because it's always good to be able to spend an entire season getting to know someone. You got to spend all four, all four of the seasons. You want to see how people act when it's hot? I'm preaching. You want to know how people respond when it's cold? Want to know when people, how people respond when it's both hot and cold? Analogies are crazy. You want to know how people are, and many times, it takes an entire season, a cycle, many times to get a chance to know what you need to know about specific people. So that's how we get to Acts chapter 13 that says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, they didn't end up like this. It took time. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Somebody say called. The Bible says, then they have then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So Barnabas and, and Saul, who was Paul, was sent out by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, my Bible says, so Barnabas and Saul. Who is Paul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read that one more time. My Bible says, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. The previous verse, it says, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work, for the work which I have called Barnabas and Saul. This verse says, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then they sailed for the island of Cyprus. Why is this important? Because verse 5 tells on them. It says, there in the town of Salamis, which is in Cyprus, they went to the Jewish synagogue and preached. 
the word of God. The Bible says John Mark was with them. As their assistant. The Bible says that John Mark was with them, but in the text before it says that Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to separate both Barnabas and Saul for what I have called them to to do. But verse four, verse five says that John Mark was also with them. What are you saying? Mark was not sent out by the Holy Spirit. He was chosen by Barnabas. I told you this last week. They had someone in their circle. Who was invited into the circle because somebody else chose him, not because the spirit invited them. Why is this important? Because the Bible says in verse 13 that Paul and his companions left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia. They went on a detour. They decided that they were going to do more than what they originally said they were going to do. Because Cyprus is where Barnabas was from. And Cyprus, Barnabas said, let's go to my hometown first. John Mark was also from Cyprus. And so John Mark wanted to be a part of the equation because they were going to a familiar territory. But now they're going to detour and they're going to travel upward into the mountains. And John Mark had the audacity to say, well, I didn't sign up for this. But he wasn't called to them in the first place. And so Paul releases John Mark from the circle. And we know in chapter 15, when Barnabas wants to bring him back, that, John, uh, that, that Paul was like, no, he can't come back because he wasn't called to be in this circle. Mark was in the circle because somebody else chose him, not because God called him. So when Paul releases him from the circle, the mission was never compromised. You'll miss it. John came into the circle because somebody chose him, not because the Holy Spirit endorsed him. Why is this important? This is important because when Saul had the courage to dismiss this person from the circle, the mission was not compromised. We hold on to people and we're scared to let them go because we believe that if we let them go, we're afraid that a certain way of life will be damaged or we won't be able to do what we normally was able to do. And so we hold on to people. But what happens if we let go of those wrong people? The wrong people will never compromise the mission that God has called you for. Which prompts the question. What is your selection process to choosing your friends? I'm talking about a seat at the table today. What is your selection process of choosing people to become your friends? Your process should consist of something more than you have something in common. Your process should consist of something more. You just have something in common. Because common interest can easily become uncommon interest. Your process should consist of something more than that person was available and accessible. You'll be surprised at how many people end up in our circles because they were available and we were lonely. Many people we are aligned with and aligned, and, and aligned to Sometimes they're there because they were available and they were easily accessible and we had room for them to come in. Your process should consist of something more than you have chemistry. We can have chemistry and you still not be called to me. Your process of selecting the right friends to be in your circle has to be something other than the fact that you have common friends. John Mark was a relative and friend to Barnabas. And so he ended up in Paul's circle because he was a friend of somebody else. And how many times do we 
have people occupying seats at our table by default? How many default friends do we have sitting at our table? That's my friend. How is it your friend needs a friend, somebody else? That might be, but make sure that they're still assigned to you. Because they could be occupying a seat at your table when God is trying to bring somebody else. But somebody else can't sit down because you got too many chairs occupied by default people. I need you to be called. I need you to be sitting at my table because the Holy Spirit endorses you. I don't mean to be over spiritual, but relationships is life. But get this. So when Paul dismisses John from his circle, when John Mark leaves, so does Barnabas. Uh Uh-oh, it's about to get thick in here. Barnabas sought out Paul. They developed a tight-knit relationship. He was his mentor. He taught him a lot that he learned. But when he released one person and they had a sharp disagreement in Acts chapter 15, Barnabas decided that he preferred John Mark. And so he left to be with John Mark. Oh, wow. When Mark leaves, so does Barnabas. And this is what happened in in chapter 15, verse 36 to 41. I'm going to go right there to verse 39. This is what it says. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Why? Because John Mark is comfortable with hometown. Paul chose, everybody says Silas, and he left and the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care there. Mm. So, Barnabas leaves, Silas comes. But in chapter 16, verses 1 through 5, the very next chapter, somebody say the next chapter. Turn those lights up. In chapter 16, verses 1 through 5, I'm just going to read the verse, couple of verses. Then he came to Derby and Lustra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named, everybody say Timothy. The son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren because you want to make sure the people invited to the circle got a good reputation, good character. And the Bible says who were at Lustra and Iconium, Paul wanted to have him go on with him. Paul wanted to invite him into his circle and he took him and they were circumcised. And, and if you look at it, the Bible says in verse four. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them to the decrees and keep them determined the disciples. They went and did ministry together. But the Bible said that he went out and he sought him. And he found him. But if you look at chapter 18, verses 1, it says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens. Everybody say Athens. And he went to Corinth and he found a certain Jew named Aquila. He Found, somebody say invite. He found a certain Jew named Aquila born in Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them and he invited them. Into his circle. The Bible says in verse 3. So because he was of the same trade. Because Paul had a trade. And he stayed with Priscilla and Aquila. And they worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. And they and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. And persuaded both Jews and and, and Greeks. In verse 5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia. Paul was compelled by the spirit. And testified to the Jews. Silas. Timothy. Aquila. And Priscilla and Paul. He left in chapter 13. In chapter 15, in chapter 13, he left three, 
four of those people, three of those people, but he had Barnabas with them. And then Barnabas fell off. And so now he has a lot of empty chairs at his table. Paul. Do you see what's taking place here? As he shift seasons, so does his circle. He, he left one place and now he finds, he seeks out and he invites some other people into his circle. He invites Timothy, Priscilla, Aquila, and he has Silas at his table. Paul teaches us that your circle needs to be diverse. Because Priscilla, a woman, Aquila, Italian Jews. But then he teaches us that your circle needs to be strategic. And he teaches us that your circle should always be maturing. But this is what I like, though. Here's the real moment that we, what we learn when you examine his circle in Acts chapter 13, and you look at his circle now, five people should always be sitting at your table, and this is very simple. Five people should always be sitting at your table. Every table you erect, it's good to have five, at least five different types of people at your table. You need a coach. You need a coach at your table. I need a coach at my table. I need a coach at my table. Thank you, brother. He knows me long enough to know. You have a coach. You have a whistle. This has never been used. You can blow it just a little bit. It's never been used. Then you have you have your clipboard. You have your whistle. You have your hat. You, you need a coach at your table. You need someone to help you to see clearly. You need someone who can help you who help provide you direction. You need someone at your table who can be a coach. Someone whose purpose is simply to help you to see clearly. Someone to help you to navigate and find direction. Everybody say coach. But when you're dressing your table, when you're dressing your table and you're inviting a coach to your table, you have to make sure you ask yourself one critical question. Am I willing to be vulnerable enough to expose the underdeveloped areas of my life so that someone can come in and help me grow? I'm going to say it again. When you are determined to bring a coach into your life at your table because we need to always be dressing our table, you have to ask yourself a very critical question. Am I willing to be vulnerable enough to expose the underdeveloped areas of my life so that I can grow? You got to ask yourself that when you're inviting a coach. But we have one more. We have another one. We need a compass. You got a coach, but you need someone who is a compass. You need someone who is a compass. Here is a compass. Here is a compass. Here is a compass. Here is a compass. You can have a seat at my table. You are my compass. You are my compass. The person who you invite into your table who is a compass. Here's the thing. This person is usually where you desire to be. Or who has accomplished something that you desire to accomplish. So the compass that you bring to your table, the goal is for you to glean from them and learn from their mistakes so you don't have to make the same mistakes they made. Because experience is the greatest teacher, but it's also the most expensive one. And most of us can't afford to make certain mistakes. And so you need a compass who is that north star who has accomplished something or who is in a certain place where you know that's where you're called to be or where you desire to be. And so you bring that person into your life and you offer them a seat at your table. But you have to you have to ask yourself this critical question when you bring a compass into your table. 
Am I mature enough to sit at the table with someone who knows more than me and who is more accomplished than me and I not feel inferior or insecure? Am I mature enough to invite someone into my table who knows more than me, who is more accomplished than me, and I not feel insecure and inferior? Because you can be so insecure and feel so inferior that you can invite this person to your table, but they never have a voice. I don't need you just to bring somebody to your table. If you're going to bring them to your table, you also need to give them voice at your table. You have a coach, you have a compass, but then you have a confidant. You have a confidant. We hadn't caught on yet. We have a confidant. Nobody want to sit at my table. Now your confidant is your greatest cheerleader. But usually with a little bit more vitality, you know, a little bit more excitement. Your, your, your confidant is one of your greatest cheerleaders. Your confidant knows the real you. The confidant knows your greatest fears and failures and your greatest feats. They know your secrets. Your confidant sits at that table. Your confidant can also be your accountability partner. Your confidant sits at your table. But you have to be able to ask this question. If you're going to have somebody at your table who is your confidant because your coach doesn't have to be your confidant. I'm going to teach you. You have to ask yourself this question. Can I be honest enough with myself to trust someone with my deepest secrets? Do I have the courage to take off my mask? To let someone see the innermost parts of me. You got to ask yourself that question. You got your coach. You got your compass. You got your confidant, your cheerleader. But you also have the challenger. All right. A little quicker. You have your challenger. You can sit right there. Your challenger is your iron sharpener. Your iron, don't, don't, don't touch this. Just. I, 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 I'm liable, liable, liable. Your, your challenger is the person at your table who you give permission to challenge your normal and to challenge your perspective. You can challenge me all day, but if I didn't give you permission, I'm just going to be defensive and not receive anything you have to say. But it's the person at your table, and some say that's supposed to be a confidant, but sometimes when your confidant knows so much, it's hard for them to really challenge you. I need somebody who knows experience. I'm saying you need someone at your table. You know when you go to them, they won't tell you what you want to hear. When you go to this, this challenger, they're going to challenge you to see this in a way that you refuse to see it because you want somebody to tell you that you're right, but he's going or she's going to tell you, no, you're wrong on this one. You can hate me. You can be mad at me, but I'm here to tell you the truth. This is the person at your table who will challenge you. This is your Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. But you got to ask yourself this question. Am I disciplined enough? To give someone permission to challenge my normal and to challenge my perspective without me feeling attacked 
and becoming defensive? Am I willing to be disciplined enough to give someone permission to challenge my normal and to challenge my perspective without me becoming defensive and feeling like somebody is attacking me? But the last one is the colleague. Everybody say colleague. Is the colleague. All right. Nobody won't. Sometimes you got to keep asking. You got to keep pursuing. You got to keep inviting. Even if after the first three times you've invited, you still don't get nobody to occupy that seat. You keep inviting. You keep pursuing and you keep praying. You keep inviting. You keep pursuing and you keep praying. If the seat is still open, you keep inviting. You keep pursuing and you keep praying. You, you, you not... You, you, come on, some of us who've been in relationship, out of relationship, you still want to be married, so you don't stop dating. You still, you still go at it until you find the right one. You keep on moving. I'm going to keep on preaching. But the colleague is the person at your table who you take time to cultivate. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the person at your table. See, here's the thing. Everybody at your table are people who are helping you to become what you need to become, right? But see, you also need a Timothy at your table. See, Paul had all these people helping him, but he also had to have somebody in his circle that he was helping to cultivate so that they can become who they needed to become because sometimes people have some 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 leaves and some stuff that is they they need somebody to help prune and help make them look better because they got some dead leaves and they need somebody to come into their life and to to help them and so you need to have a circle that is not just consisting of people who are feeding you you have to have somebody in your circle who you're also helping to cultivate so that they can become who God has called them to become. You have a colleague at your table. Let me, I got the bottle, so I need to be able to say to my assistant that I used it. But when you invite this person who you are mentoring into your circle, you have to ask yourself a critical question. Can I be patient enough to cultivate someone else without demanding them to learn and to grow at my pace and in my expectation? Can I be patient enough to bring someone into my circle and not demand that they grow and learn at my pace? And in my expectation. But here's the thing. I, I got to bless somebody as I leave you here. Here's the thing. You have your colleague, your challenger, your cheerleader, who is your confidant. You have your compass. You also have you, my coach. My coach. You have different people at your table. You have to think about the words equality and equity when you're thinking about your table. Everybody is equal, equally important. Everybody at your table has equal value. But everybody in your table does not have equal purpose. Everybody at your table is equally important they're equally valuable to you. You love them with the love of Jesus Christ. Everybody is important, but everybody does not have the same purpose, meaning that you have to go about the relationship differently because everybody is not a colleague and everybody cannot be treated like the colleague and everybody is not a coach. And everybody can't be treated like the coach because the time that I spend with the coach is different than the time that I spend with the colleague. The time that I spend with the confidant is different than the time that I spend with the challenger. But as long as I'm trying to spend equitable time with everybody, I will, I will, I will be disappointed and disillusioned every time. 
And sometimes people in your circle might complain that you're not giving them what you're giving somebody else. But everybody at your table, they're equally important, but they got different purposes. If you have all colleagues at your table, your colleague, your colleague, your colleague, your colleague, your colleague, you will go bankrupt. Why will you go bankrupt? Because all you're doing is giving, giving, cultivating, cultivating, giving. And after a while, you will realize that you have overspent emotionally, physically, mentally. Everybody at your table can occupy the same position. And many of us have a table of people who do the same thing. What are you saying? Everybody at your table can't be confidants. I confide in you the same way I confide in everybody else. Oh, yeah, you know everything. You know everything. You know everything. You're my greatest cheater. You, you, you're my confidant. If everybody at your table tells you what you want to hear, if everybody at your table is a cheerleader, what's going to happen is you're going to go in circles and you're going to become spoiled. Because everybody gives you the same advice to do the same thing. So you're just going to keep going in circles and you're going to become spoiled and your world view will be skewed. Because you think everything should look just the way that it's always looking. Can nobody challenge you? Because everybody at my table is supposed to tell me the same thing that everybody outside the table is supposed to tell me. So when somebody outside of your table tells you something different, they are not your echo chamber. So therefore, they are the enemy. I'm trying to preach. The last thing, everybody at your table can't be compasses and can't be coaches. Everybody at your table cannot be a compass and everybody at your table cannot be a coach. Here's the thing. You, otherwise you will, you will become ruined and you will become toxic. Everybody at your table is a coach and a compass depositing into me, building me up, helping me. Everybody at your table, the only people at your table are people who are depositing in you and giving you what you need and, and growing you. You will become toxic and you will become ruined because you were created to replicate yourself and reproduce yourself. Let me help you. You were created not simply to receive and never release. And if everybody at your table is a coach and if everybody at your table is a compass and all you're doing is receiving and receiving and never releasing, you'll kill yourself spiritually. Because God created us to replicate and reproduce. Let me help you. Let me give you a different analogy. You were not designed to be a reservoir. You were designed to be a conduit, a reservoir, a body of water. You just pour water into and this just stays. You, it keeps receiving. It keeps receiving. But the reservoir has no way of letting any water out. So it goes to another body of water. You were designed to be a body of water that gives water to some other bodies of water. What are you saying, Isaac? The reason why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea is because it always receives water from other bodies of water. And as it continues to receive water from other bodies of water, it has no way of releasing water to any other bodies of water. So it continues to receive water from different streams, but it never releases. And because it never releases any water, the salt content inside of the Dead Sea becomes so toxic that any living organism that ever touches the Dead Sea dies. Why? Because it receives, never releases. So the people at your table can't just be people who feed you. It'll ruin you. You got to have somebody at your table that you're also helping to cultivate. Who has a seat 
at your table. Let us pray. Lord, we bless you. We thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. Help us, God, to seek your face as we're trying to dress the table that you've given us. It might not be perfect. Well, Lord, help us to seek you the se- with the same amount of intensity we seek you when we want you to answer any other prayers. Lord, we want the right people aligned with us because you've given us a specific purpose. And Lord, we thank you for that purpose. But continue to bring people into our lives who will help to shape us and help to sharpen us. Because, Lord, you've called us to reproduce. You didn't call us to just receive and never release. But, Lord, we bless you and God, we thank you for this day. It's in Jesus Christ's name as we pray and all of God's people said together. Amen. Amen.